A very warm welcome to everyone to this SimScale webinar on vibration assessment of an electric motor. Thank you all very much for joining us today. My name is Paul Lethbridge, and I'm the Director of Product Solutions and Marketing at, here at SimScale, and I'll be your host today. Today's presenter is David Short, Structural Mechanical Product Manager at SimScale. David has a Bachelor's of Engineering from Newcastle University in the UK plus a Master's of Science from Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Okay, let's take a look at the agenda for today's webinar. So basically, we are going to get into a case study that is going to outline uh, the vibration assessment of the electric motor. And then, without much further ado, uh, we will get into a live demo um, to show you the platform live. And after that, we'll come back and with a, a short Q&A. All right, so with that, David, it's over to you. The floor is yours. Perfect, thank you very much, Paul. So thanks a lot for the introduction and welcome to everybody watching. And today we are, as, as Paul said, we're going to be looking at structural analysis and in particular, understanding the value that design engineers can actually gain from a cloud native simulation solution, that being SimScale. Um, so specifically the case study that we will look at is both vibration and mechanical assessment in general of a couple of critical components of this electric motor model that we have in front of us here, okay? So we're gonna look at two different analysis types, so multidisciplinary analyses, SimScale offers uh, many different types of, of simulation, all in a centralized location, right? So it's, it's going to allow design engineers to design with different um, disciplines of physics um, and take that into the account, into account within their design processes. So the first thing we will look at is the actual vibration assessment of the supporting bracket for the electric motor. Now that is a very critical um, component because if we excite vibration of that support structure, it can come into lots of, uh, it, can, in, it can produce some really serious problems in the assembly in general. So it could um, create vibration where we would have clearance issues, maybe touching and, and, uh, and noise, even things like bolt, bolt self-loosening and the whole thing falling apart and we're having damage. Um, and all sorts of nasty things that we do not want to happen. Now we can do some fairly simple analysis to really mitigate the chances of, of exciting resonance of, of the supporting bracket. And we will have a look at that specifically today. We're gonna do some geometry changes to try and mitigate that dangerous uh, vibration that, that would happen around the, the, at, the, at the speeds of the rotating shaft itself, okay? so. If we look at the, the model on the right hand side, this is our electric motor. So it's a 60 Hertz with six poles um, and the operating speed with the rated load is at about 1,140 RPM. Now that is 19 rotations per second. And so that's your Hertz equivalent value as well. So 19 Hertz. Um, so we need to be very careful if we see um, eigen modes or, or a vibrating frequency, a natural frequency, somewhere close to that operating speed in its Hertz equivalent value. Okay, so that's very, very critical. Um, and we're going to be looking to, to mitigate the dangers associated with that kind of vibration. The second assessment we will have a look at is a safety factor check for the shaft itself under torque, under um, a couple of different uh, load cases, real world load cases. And here we've got a validation goal of ensuring a minimum factor of safety of two um, for normal operation. Now, we're using steel for um, the, the, the shaft, mild steel, and a safety factor of two is a pretty good starting point because if we <clears throat> think of a safety factor of, of two, that's gonna mean that our stress is about 50% of the yield stress of the material. And that actually brings it pretty close down to the actual endurance limit of the steel itself, meaning um, unlimited life, unlimited fatigue life. So we want to try and ensure um, at least a minimum of two. And if we're getting up to three and four, then that's absolutely great. We're, we're, we're then guaranteeing um, infinite fatigue life of the part as well, okay? 
So without further ado, ah, having said that, I'm actually going to give a little bit of a of a of a uh, description of the process of SimScale, how it looks like um, from start to finish before we actually jump into the into the session and we'll get SimScale uh, um, up and running. So I've already outlined the two different analysis types that we will be having a look at, one being the actual support bracket vibration. Now for that, we're going to upload our geometry, create a simulation model, a mesh with finite elements, and then apply a simulation to that a frequency analysis. So frequency domain, linear dynamics um, to that bracket geometry. Similarly, for the um, shaft simulation, we'll extract the shaft out from our um, electronic electric motor model. Again, build a simulation model, mesh that with some second order elements and run a linear static analysis with some given load cases. And we'll do that all today uh, with yourselves. And we're going to be running those with those added advantages of a cloud native solution. So that means unlimited parallel computation. It means having some smart defaults in place. So we really try to um, provide a solution, which means that you don't need to be an expert in simulation numerics. We're going to provide smart defaults based on the physics that you provide in the simulation setup to allow for, um, for, for value um, with, with limited clicks from, from the simulation solution, okay? So without further ado, let's get into SimScale. So you'll see this come into your screen now. This is SimScale, completely based in a web browser, contained in a web browser. Um, and that comes with it a couple of massive advantages. Number one, there's no installation involved. All you need is your uh, login details, your credentials, your single sign-on, um, and, and you're then into your software. So there's no installation. Um, to, to actually be accessing SimScale. And it also comes with the huge advantage of accessibility. So you can access this from anywhere at any time. And because the simulations themselves don't actually run on your machine, we're not, we're not, um, we're not running on your local hardware, the actual computations, so that's all gonna be remotely solved. It means that it can be accessed at any scale as well. So you bring in small models, it's going to run on a small machine. If you bring in a large, big assembly with nonlinear contacts, nonlinear physics, all sorts of jazzy stuff, that's going to run on a massive machine. So it means you can scale your simulations, both in terms of um, complexity and model size. And it also means that you can run an unlimited number of simulations in parallel. So you can have as many different design candidates as you like, and you can run all those simulations at the same time. So this is the big big point of SimScale, it's in the name even, so scalability, right? You can scale in terms of model and physics, but you can also scale in terms of the projects. In a single project, you can be running unlimited simulations, and you can have as many different projects as you like ongoing all at the same time in the SimScale infrastructure. So let's get into today's um, technical demonstration, we're firstly going to have a look at the frequency analysis. So from our simulation library, we can choose a frequency analysis. So that's going to be a modal analysis looking at linear frequency domain uh, dynamics, and we can create a simulation. It can be a template there, and you can load up all the, um, bring in all the settings. We're not going to go through all the setup today, um, it's very simple. Um, just a, just a few clicks here. I'll do that for the for the for the the shaft safety factor simulation um, in five minutes or so. We don't want to go through too many setups in in this session. But uh, just so we 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 have a look at the the frequency analysis. So we've got the frequency analysis um, set here. I've applied steel to my bracket. So I'm applying steel to my bracket here, and I've applied some boundary conditions. Okay, so I've got a fixed support on the bottom, modeling the connection to the table. And now I'm modeling the actual electric motor. So the mass of the electric motor itself, I'm not going to bother bringing in the whole electric motor um, into my simulation model, um, but I need to have its effect uh, in terms of mass, in terms of moments of inertia, on on because that will obviously affect the vibration of the full um, of the full system as well. So we can do that in a with a handy boundary condition using a point mass, where we actually apply a mass to a given point at the center of gravity of our electric motor with a given mass and a given mass moment of inertia as well. Okay, those are that's going to be then um, connected to the bolt holes. 
through deformable spider elements. Okay. We can then um, we can then start running simulations. I'm actually basically using just default um, default settings here and saying that I want to find the first ten eigen modes of my bracket. Those are going to be the lowest energy modes, and those ones are going to be the most dangerous because they're going to be the most easy to excite. Okay. So I've run a quick simulation already here. So it took a minute to run. And out of that simulation, you already saw a little animation of the first mode, but out of a simulation like this, we're looking for the first 10 modes, uh, we get an eigenfrequency plot, which shows us our natural frequencies going up in order of, um, of frequency. And we can see that our first eigenfrequency is down at about 21 Hertz. Now, if we remember our rotating speed of the electric motor had a Hertz equivalent of 19 Hertz, that means that this this um, this mode here, or this eigenfrequency, is of um, pretty critical importance. So we could very easily be exciting this mode just by actually running the electric motor itself. So if there's any level of unbalance in the motor, it's going to be causing a vibration at 20 hertz. Now that um, that that excitation could cause resonance. Right, because in the bracket itself, because we actually are exciting a given eigenfrequency here. And if we have a look at what that eigenfrequency looks like in terms of um, how it actually animates, so if we animate that first eigenfrequency, we can see that this is not a good, not a good mode shape to be to be exciting, because then we're going to have the electric motor going up and down, up and down potentially rattling on the bracket supports themselves, causing noise, causing damage, all sorts of nasty things. Okay, so this is our Eiger mode of importance, and this is what we need to mitigate with some geometry changes. We can also look at the other modes as well, switch to um, switch through the different Eiger modes and have a look at what, we, what, what we've got there. Okay, but as I say, the, the first Eiger mode is our critical Eiger mode. Now, Len, let's see SimScale the real value of SimScale. The real value is not looking at setups and things like this. It's a fairly basic modal analysis setup. The value comes at this point. Okay, so in SimScale, I have uploaded um, a few. Well, I've got my actual full motor assembly here, the electric motor assembly, and then I've got a few different design candidates for my bracket. Now I've done this iteratively, so um, I generally use OnShape, um, and then I will. I, I saw my nasty mode in bracket design one, and I thought, how can I mitigate that? I need to stiffen up this part so that we can um, raise that eigenfrequency out from the dangerous uh, range. So what I've done is made some geometry changes. This is my first geometry change. I've added a couple of ribs in here to try and stiffen up the part. Um, and then what we can do, so we switched on to the new geometry, and now we can start the next simulation. So we can run my next simulation, run two is, I'm just gonna call it B2 for saving time here. So that's my bracket design two, and we'll let that run. But the beauty is we can actually already go back and start um, applying a new geometry as well. So we can go back to geometry, switch on to bracket, bracket three. You're gonna see I'm a pretty terrible designer. Um, there's the, the, I needed a lot of iterations to do what I needed to do. Um, so I've added some more ribs along here, okay. And basically, my first iterations did did absolutely nothing, but we'll see that in a in a moment's time. B three. We can go back and switch again. I started getting a little bit more heavy-handed with my bracket, so adding some more structural support in the front as well, adding some more ribs around to to, to stiffen things up. four so we've already got three simulations running in parallel and we can keep going my fifth attempt uh, but you know you get feedback every time you do every time you do a simulation like this you get feedback did it help did it not help so it also helps you to become a better designer as well to really understand what do I need to do in terms of adding 
uh, weight and adding structure to actually cause the, the, the increase in stiffness that I'm after. Now that might also go for weight reduction in other kind of simulations, uh, but that's how we do this with, with uh, sort of parametric based optimization. And that's my final. That's my final bracket design here. Okay, so all of those simulations will run in parallel. And whilst they're running, um, so they should run in about the same time as it um, took to, to, to run the first simulation as well. Whilst those ones are running, what I'd like to do is just jump back into the presentation so that we can have a look at the, um, the results. Okay, so I've, I've tried to do a nice couple of slides to, to really, um, present how how my iterative process has actually looked like okay so this is where I started this was my um, we can see on the red line that is my shaft speed so at about 19 Hertz and we can see the first eigenfrequency for bracket design one was basically at around 20 Hertz so super dangerous our shaft speed is probably going to excite that first eigenfrequency causing causing bolt self-loosening, causing noise, causing damage, all sorts of nasty things. So here's my design two. We've done a little bit to stiffen it up and raise that first eigenfrequency. So we're trying to really maximize the first eigenfrequencies to get it away from the shaft speed. Bracket three, yeah, all right, not bad. The fourth design change did absolutely nothing. And then I started adding um, a fair bit of stiffness on the bottom here. And this was, this was the key, right? So having um, a little bit more stiffness um, on the front of the model there to reduce that, that uh, the, or the, reduce the ease at which we could bend the, 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 the bracket uh, backwards and for, forward. So uh, bracket uh, design five, I was definitely onto something and I kept going with the same concept for design six. And then we really raised it up to over 50 Hertz. So we've doubled the, the first eigenfrequency, and we've made sure that it is now a long way away from our shaft speed. So we've mitigated the danger here that the shaft speed is going to actually excite the eigenfrequency sort of by default, okay? So that's a, a typical example of how you can use SimScale simulations within your design phase, um, not only for coming up with um, weight reduced um, design candidates for, for, for static structure analysis, but you can also do it with vibration assessment. So taking into account vibrational performance at the, the early stage in design is gonna be critical for cost savings because vibration, as we all know, is one of the things that can really um, cause product defects and mean that we have to uh, recall products and, and, uh, and and all the things that we don't really want to do as, as design engineers. So if we know this, this information up front and we can design for it, um, then we're going to be um, improving the efficiency of the, of the organization in, in general, okay? Now then, let's get into the shaft safety factor analysis. So back to SimScale. Now we can, so I've actually, Use the, the the SimScale CAD mode to um, extract the, the the shaft from my from my assembly model here, and now we can create a new simulation. So we'll we'll do this, um, or I'll at least show you the workflow right from start to finish, where we go create simulation, and in this case we're going to be using a static simulation, linear static for this um, analysis. If we had non-linear materials, non-linear contacts, or large deformations. We could also run that as a non-linear static analysis. But in this case, uh, we, we only need to do um, a quick talk um, simulation here. Okay, so you can see that it's created a template, um, a sort of checklist of the things that need to get done before our simulation is ready to go. A lot of that is taken care of by SimScale Smart Defaults, like I talked about earlier. Um, and then the designer is left with the decisions for the design parameters, the materials and the actual operating conditions. So let's add some materials. So you can either use our default materials. I've actually got a couple of custom materials that I like to use here. Um, so I'm using a mild steel, um, simulation, uh, mild steel um, material. Now, for companies, you can you can have company uh, material databases. 
Um, and so I'm using a, a couple of customer a custom uh, materials here uh, that I've that I've created, and uh, we can apply that to my to my steel shaft here. Okay, now let's add some boundary conditions. So we need to add some fixation, uh, so it's not going to be flying off. And I would like to do that at the actual connecting point where um, the where the shaft itself would then be um, be connected to the load. Right, so this is really where the where the power is going to be applied through, um, and we'll actually apply the torque not at that point. We'll fix it at that point, and we'll apply the torque um, from where the actual magnets are are actually applying the torque on the shaft itself. Okay, and we can do that using a remote force on this surface here, and then we can apply a moment of, for example. 10 newton meters and i want to make sure that my moment is actually uh, being applied around the center of rotation of my shaft and i'm gonna do it like this let's just make it transparent so we can make sure we've got our center of rotation in the right position and then we are good to go so we're not adding a force we're adding a moment um, on this surface around a given external point here okay last boundary condition we might need is the actual centrifugal force um, that the, the shaft is under so again let's go with it's going to be rotating in the y direction and let's do the same again make sure it's rotating around the central point okay and we're going to apply that to the whole volume there we go mm -hmm. We have to apply the rotating speed so it does catch you out if you made a mistake it catches you out and say hey stop there do it right so we've got to apply a rotational velocity here we'll do it in radians per second so equivalent to the um, rotating speed of the shaft which was 1140 rpms that gives us a radius per second of i think it was 119 i did that calculation just a minute ago something like this okay and then we can go ahead and run the simulation. So that is under 10 Newton meters of torque. And that's sort of the max torque applied um, on, on, this, on, this, um, on this shaft here. Okay, so we've set up the simulation. That's gonna run, that's gonna take a couple of seconds. Um, and I can, ha I can show you the one we've done earlier. We can also check our, our frequency analysis. Now we can see that all of the different bracket designs um, finished. Yeah, with one minute simulations or so. Exactly. Okay. And now we can check the, the shaft under torque because I've run a couple of different load cases here with exactly the same setup. I've run one with the 0 0.5 Newton meters of torque and one with 10 Newton meters of torque as well. So now we can go in and post process those results. Now I've got a I've got the safety factor um, displayed first. We can actually use statistics here and um, take a look at what is our minimum safety factor. Um, so above above three, that's great. We were we were targeting above two, um, but uh, above three is even even greater. We're definitely guaranteeing that these stresses are going to uh, remain below the endurance limit here. Um, so that's great. If we need some more detail in the actual stress state, then you can go and have a look at the, the von Mises stress themselves. Now, I didn't really mention meshing. I used automatic meshing here, which gave us second order uh, tetrahedral elements. So pretty good for, for actually um, capturing complex geometry here. And you can have a look here at the, the mesh uh, refinement that we've got, automatic uh, mesh refinement for this, this shaft body here. Okay, so let me, jump straight back to the presentation because we're nearly out of time and I really want to make sure that we can answer any questions that you might have. Um, so let's just round up what we saw from the shaft safety factor. We've had a look at von Mises stress um, and safety factor. Now for our load case one, which was the sort of nominal torque of the electric motor of 0.5 Newton meters, we're only showing a peak stress of four megapascals, not very much at all, having a very, very large minimum factor of safety of, of 62. And then load case two, the maximum torque of this electric motor going up to 10 Newton meters, 
then we're looking at peak stresses of about 80 uh, megapascals and a minimum factor of safety of three. So both times achieving the design goal. Now to summarize, that's gone very quickly. Um, to summarize what we've had a look at today, um, we've looked at the key analyses involved in mechanical assessment of an electric motor. Firstly, the vibration assessment of the bracket itself, where we identified the first eigenfrequency as being dangerous because it was so close to the shaft speed. And then we successfully inflated or maximized the first eigenfrequency through geometry optimization to mitigate that danger of exciting the first um, natural frequency of the bracket. Secondly, we checked the shaft uh, structural integrity under a couple of real world loading conditions and ensuring the factor of safety did not drop below two. Okay, that was it. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks very much for watching. If you have any questions, please do uh, write in. I don't know, Paul, have we got some questions coming through? David, thanks very much. Yes, we've had uh, a bunch of really good questions coming in. I'm not sure if we have time to go through all of them, but uh, we have about four minutes or so. Are you, I mean, are you happy to answer a few? I'll just yeah, read them there's, out. There, you know, there's, there's cover the most interesting ones if we can in in speed record time. And um, uh, yeah, so let's, yeah. let's go. Let's answer a couple, and then the others I can answer by email as well. Lovely. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. Uh, so, OK, so I'll just pick a couple out here. So here's one uh, in the first case study. How does the point mass approximation approximate and how different would the result be if we you know, compared that approximation with actually modeling you know, the real electric motor? Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be pretty close, to be honest, because we've given it the mass moment of inertia take into account the full uh, the full body so that mass distribution is actually going to be included in the linear dynamic simulation so that will be taken into account for the overall structure what we will not see is any detail in the actual eigenfrequencies of the electric motor itself so we're really just cutting that completely out of the analysis uh, and just looking at the bracket itself um, if you want to have a look at more detail in the electric motor itself then by all means then you can run that full um, modal analysis with all of that you can then even see the the um, the mode shapes on on the fan at the back for example and and take into account the gyroscopic stiffnesses as well in modal analysis that's a new feature that we've released as well um, so yeah the, the 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 possibilities are endless if you want to go into more detail then then then, then go for it Brilliant, David, thank you. Uh, had a couple of questions relating to, really relating to, uh, you know, how does, you know, can you run your know, parametric design optimization? Um, is it possible to do like a Monte Carlo analysis, things like that? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so uh, I, I think that the, the most concise one is, does SimScale have the capability to couple with an external optimization engine? So at the moment, what we're doing is API driven optimization loops. Right, so we you can you can run SimScale uh, programmatically as well, um, and that means that we can run parametric optimization very very efficiently. So if you've got a parameterized model in say Onshape in SolidWorks or something like this, you can set that up with SimScale's API to to run these optimization loops um, in in and and give the feedback from those those um, uh, from those simulations. All, all put into an actual plot together. What we haven't gone into yet are things like topology optimization, uh, but with the, the advent of our, our API as well, it allows us to collaborate with other optimization engines. Um, it's a topic for future developments. At the moment, we're sticking with parametric optimization, uh, but absolutely, that's a, that's a topic that we want to get into more and more. Brilliant, David, thank you very much. There's actually a bunch of other questions which I, I really like to see us answer, but we are going to be out of time. So I think what we'll do is we'll follow up separately uh, mm -hmm. after the after this uh, webinar on those. Uh, David, could you put, move down to the last slide? Um, and yeah, just wanted to once again say to everybody, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, from a next steps perspective, you know, to get you we're really keen, if you're really keen to get in and start using SimScale, you can sign up and start simulating right now. Uh, there's, uh, it's just go to simscale.com and there's a, it's pretty straightforward to navigate to the start simulating now button. You can see on the screen there. Um, you can also, uh, if you want 
a bit more than that, you want a demo, you can request a one-on-one -on -one demo from us by uh, contacting us at sales at simscale.com and we'll get back to you within typically a business day. And uh, as promised, uh, we will get a uh, recorded version of this webinar. We'll get a link to you um, and uh, after this webinar. So uh, obviously you're here, you're, you're, you're listening to this, you'll get the link, but also the people that couldn't make it as well will get the link as well who have registered. So with that, we are right at the bottom of the hour, 30 minutes right on. So David, thank you very much for helping to keep us on time. And uh, thank you, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed the rest of your day, evenings, afternoons, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.